It's my pleasure to join you all today. Uh, we have launching a three-part series on contemporary issues in health, law, and bioethics. Today, we have a program that's centered on ethical and workforce considerations in abortion care provisions. The guest joining me today is Dr. Monica McLemore. She is an associate professor of family health care nursing department at the University of California, San Francisco. I'll give a more in-depth uh, introduction in just a moment. I want to alert all of you that if you have questions for us today, then please put those in the Q&A. We have a program that's going to be an armchair fireside type of discussion, and I couldn't be more pleased than to be doing this with one of my favorite people uh, of all times ever, ever, uh, with Dr. Monica McLemore, not only for the professional experience that she brings, but also uh, the great depth of integrity uh, that she brings to all that she does. Couldn't be more honored than to have her with us today. So I'm gonna get us uh, started. My name is Michelle Bratcher Goodwin. I am a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School and a chancellor's professor at the University of California, Irvine, where I'm also the founding director of the Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. Some of you might be familiar with my work outside of that as the executive producer and host of On the Issues with Michelle Goodwin at Ms. Magazine. I'm so happy to have also had Dr. McLemore on that show uh, as well. And as I mentioned, today we launch off a three-part series focusing on contemporary issues in health, law, and bioethics. This session will be focused on ethical and workforce considerations in abortion care provisions. And Dr. McLemore joins me. And at the University of California, San Francisco, she is a tenured professor in the Family Health Care Nursing Department, an affiliated scientist with Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health, and a member of the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health, she retired from clinical practice as a public health and staff nurse after almost 30 years uh, of a career in that regard. Her program of research is grounded in reproductive justice, a lens she uses to understand reproductive health and rights for people with the capacity for pregnancy. Her work is grounded in the hypothesis that if we center the most marginalized and vulnerable of people, then great health care can improve, then we can perhaps reach great health care, but certainly care can improve for everybody. She conducts research across the reproductive spectrum, including abortion, birth, cancer risk, contraception, family planning, and healthy sexuality, pleasure and consent. And pleasure is very important, especially once we begin to sort of break down these intersections and histories of subordination. It couldn't be a better time for us to launch and have this conversation considering that we are in February. This is Black History Month and this builds on programming that has been done at Harvard Medical School uh, and the Center for Medical Ethics regarding uh, Black history. And it is also a time of tumultuousness around the world and also in our country, a time in which we're seeing the banning of books, uh, attacks on critical race theory, attacks on President Biden saying that he will nominate a black woman to the United States Supreme Court, attacks on reproductive health rights and justice that have taken form in state legislation in Texas, in Mississippi, those cases seen by the United States Supreme Court, but even beyond that in Florida, Indiana, Ohio, Alabama, and many other states. I want to get right to that. Um, and I want to get us started with asking Dr. McLemore what exactly she means by ethical and workforce considerations in abortion care provisions. What does that mean and how have you, Dr. McLemore, approached that in your prof professional life? Well, first of all, thank you. It is always good to be in community with you. And I'm very deeply grateful for both our professional and our personal relationship. I use she and her pronouns for the folks in the audience, and we want to welcome you to use the Q&A uh, as things come up. 
So uh, uh, let me just start by saying that I think it's really important for all audiences to understand a couple of things. We know that you know Roe versus Wade is hanging in the balance, and we we have we are all sort of sitting on pins and needles trying to figure out what the abortion care provision landscape is going to look like. But I want to give folks a little bit of a history lesson because I think if if you're going to understand the abortion com conflict in the United States, if you're going to try and understand the ethics sort of behind it, then you have to have a historical perspective to understand how we got here. So I'm going to talk about two things, and then I'll answer your question. The first one is you cannot talk about abortion care provision in the United States without acknowledging the discrediting of the grand midwives. Because when you think about the black granny midwives and the people who were taking care of folks across the country before organized medicine decided to get itself together, it was those grandmamas and, and midwives and lay folks and public health people who were providing care across the reproductive spectrum for everyone. And so, you know, when you, we think about the provision of care to pregnant capable people, if we don't acknowledge the important role of the grand midwives, then I think we would be remiss. So that they were discredited from doing their work uh, and the tools of public health were used to discredit them um, when they were providing relatively good and safe care at that time. And this was before the criminalization of abortion started to happen in the United States. And it was physicians, mostly white men, and white nurses who teamed up to discredit them. So we used to have a diverse workforce of individuals who were providing reproductive justice informed care across the spectrum. I, I get really, I go really nuts when people, you know, act like that's not true. Can I, I, I know you have additional points to add to that, but I want to ask a question that builds from that because we don't spend time really nursing the information that we get and sitting with it. So yeah. you just explained something really, really important. And if we sat with that for a moment, the fact that the majority of people providing reproductive health care in the United States had been these midwives and the majority of those midwives, I mean, overwhelmingly it was nearly 100% of that care was done by midwives, right? Right. right. And people right. thought about it, right? There were no guys with stethoscopes roaming across the plains of Africa, right? Like, you know, if, if people really think about it, right? Like there are no guys in lab coats roaming around Europe, right? In the, you know, 500s, 600s, right? You know, that that's just not happening. And then if we realize that in what became the United States, that half or a little bit more than half of those midwives were black women yeah. and i'm wondering like how do we understand that uh economically in terms of what right. that would have meant for them if they had been allowed to continue their profession what right. would that have meant in terms of how we understand and revere and look up to these medicine women these medicine people right and i mean and so it, 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 the ethics behind who should be able, who's qualified, who's capable, who's competent to be able to provide abortion care. One of my big take home points is we have, you know, siloed abortion care and abortion care training within physicians. And then we wanna be mad that we don't have greater access because we actually cut out an entire workforce that was actually safely provided. So that, that's, that, that's one of the ethical issues around workforce. <laughs> The second point I want to make, though, is we have to tell I would be remiss. I'm trained as a nurse. So I always like to clarify that for people because folks on Twitter think I misrepresent my credentials, and I do not. I'm a proud nurse. It's the only thing I've ever done for pay as an adult. But we have to own the public health nurses, the white public health nurses who were super harmful at the turn of the century, who actually also contributed to this problem. I always like to remind people that Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood was trained as a nurse. She was in the Lillian Wall, the Henry Street House group of people who are watching maternal morbidity and mortality run rampant across New York City and decided that she wanted to be able to do something about that. And that's how we got to account family planning and contraception. But to deny that history that I exist and exclusively have worked in a profession that was part of and, and problematic, but also really important and helpful right? We can hold two seemingly conflicting things together at once. We can chew gum and walk, right? <laughs> Black women certainly have had to, right? I mean, so, I mean, again, if you sort of take seriously, um, if, if you take seriously what you have said, and if we yeah. took seriously the history of Black women in medicine in this country, in healthcare, in labor, in capital development of this country, right? right? That, yes, as you say, walk and chew gum at the same time and juggle. 
all right. while at it. Exactly. So this idea that we've had this very limited notion of what's possible, that's why reproductive justice is so powerful. When you think about the ethics of abortion care provision, there's also this other piece that there has to be truth telling, right? There was a discrediting of the grand midwives that happened. So we could have always had a diversification of the healthcare workforce. That could have always been a thing because it was a thing, right? But then the second piece is this idea that we have had problematic people in our field who have made determinations about who is legitimate workforce and who isn't. And one of the ways that I think we've been really, really remiss, I mean, we opened up with a lot of the sort of harm and doom and gloom of, of Roe and our, the current state of affairs and all of that, but we've had some serious landscape wins throughout the pandemic, right? When I think about advanced practice clinicians, right? When I think about midwives, physicians, assistants, and nurse midwives, right? We've had expansion of practice and codification of their capacity to provide abortion care in New Jersey, in Virginia, in Hawaii. I, why do I know this? Minnesota, right? Is because my research and my data and my findings have been used along with advancing new standards and reproductive healthy answer program to show that advanced practice clinicians can be safe providers of abortion care, right? I've been the expert witness providing testimony, educating judges and other individuals who are trying to adjudicate these cases to shore up grow. That, that we can be safe providers of care. That's why it's unethical that if you limit who can be classified as an abortion provider, including the people having abortions themselves, right? And yes, that's a, a hat tip and a nod to self-managed abortion because people who need abortions, people who seek abortions can be their own abortion providers, right? That's why this whole ethical thing of who gets to decide who is an abortion provider is important. So, so I want to just spend one more moment on the history, right? And, and yeah. we should, because at this point, Dr. McLemore, yes. there are people trying to gut the history, right? I mean, it's 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 a stunning time where mm -hmm. we're in, where there are uh, medical books that are being proposed for destruction. Mm -hmm. There are books, children's books, written by um, Rosa Parks uh, yeah. that are being removed from school shelves. Uh, there are books about the Holocaust that are yeah. being removed from schools. Um, a lot of denialism that is uh, taking place. So spending this moment on our history, I think is, is critically important. And it's critical to the conversation that you're leading in here. So uh, a couple of points that I wanna add to it and then um, happy for your response. So as you've mentioned, the granny midwives doing this important work and really in Roe v. Wade, that 1973 opinion 70, seven to two opinions, so it's not even close. Right. Written by Justice Blackman, who's put on the court by Richard Nixon. Yep. Uh, he canvasses history and he says abortion was not always criminalized in the United States and it wasn't. And it becomes around the time of the Civil War. Right. And it becomes this important kind of galvanizing piece that implicates race and also sex. And it implicates race as folks like Horatio Storer, Joseph D. Yep. Lee are saying that white women need to use their loins and go north, south, east, and west. And they're using the American Medical Association as a platform yep. for their work. And so this very clever smear campaigns that they launched uh, were meant to be politically persuasive and to achieve legal reforms that would push midwives out. This smear campaign, as you were talking about, claimed that midwives were unhygienic, were barbarous, were non-efficacious, non-scientific. And I want to actually quote from a speech written okay. by Dr. Joseph D. Lee, who was a prominent figure at the time seeking to rid midwifery altogether. And he said, the midwife is a relic of barbarism. This is how he was describing the work that black women had been doing and that they had been relied on for doing for centuries. Yeah. He said in civilized countries, the midwife is wrong and has always been wrong. He says that the midwife is a drag on progress and a drag on science and the art of obstetrics. He says that, quote, her existence stunts the one and degrades the other. And then he goes on in really, really horrific ways uh, to describe midwifery. And that's part of the history that's missing. And that's part of what it is that you're looking to have audiences understand. Absolutely. And I'll take it a step further. Take right? it. <laughs> I see, right? 
pregnancy is not a disease state. It is a clinical condition to be witnessed and managed, right? So this whole idea that medicalization also contributes to, like people always say, well, we always have to deal with abortion exceptionalism and, and we can't have nice things because everybody's worried that abortion is gonna come into something. Actually, in some discussions, it's the notion that a normal physiological process like pregnancy, regardless of how it ends, is not a disease state. Right? I always say to people, we're always studying the outcomes of pregnancy. We study birth, we study abortion, we study miscarriage, right? But pregnancy is the actual condition. And I would argue that it's not a medical or a disease state. It's, it's, it's not a disease. It's a normal physiological process. And All so right. if we're ever gonna change a narrative, if we're ever gonna have a nuanced discussion about the role of abortion in society, then we need to really shift that to get people to understand two important concepts. The first concept is that bodily autonomy, we have that in life and death, or at least right now we do, right? Nobody can go to your grave and dig up your remains without your consent. You have to sign an organ donation you know, form when you go to renew your driver's license, right? Nobody can take your body parts without your consent right now, at least, okay? But, you know, and the second point that I think really, really matters is this whole idea that if you have bodily autonomy in life and death, then that means you are the sole arbiter, in my opinion, you are the only decision maker that matters. All right. So now we're going to unpack further because <laughs> that's a notion that's being challenged right now. Right. There, right now. Right. So, you know, and the reason why I go back to the, the decision of Roe and that it was seven to two is that there are people who would think that there has always been this tussle over abortion and that it's always been uh, Republicans on one side and Democrats on the other, which is why I always mention that of those seven justices that vote to strike down laws that banned abortion, five of them were Republican appointed on the United States Supreme Court. President George H.W. Bush, the first president, George Bush, yep. his father was Prescott Bush. Prescott Bush was the treasurer of yep. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood, yep. Of Planned Parenthood, that when Title X was shepherded through Congress and supported by Richard Nixon, that was done by George H.W. Bush. And yep. Title X provides reproductive health care for the most vulnerable of Americans. And I share that because we have gone so askew now and there's such a dramatic threat to reproductive health care as a whole right yep. i mean abortion is just one lens of it but just this week we heard about the growing rates of maternal morbidity and mortality in the united states so i'm going to take us there but first for definition because some people have said well i've heard reproductive justice i've heard reproductive rights what's the difference and oh, yeah. so dr mclemore when you center your work on reproductive justice what does that mean i sure will and i would also add you know outside of just the new numbers on maternal morbidity and mortality we also saw governor abbott you know introduce legislation around trans youth and, and gender affirming treatment that they need in order to be able to support their own behavioral mental health. Well, so if, that, right. Yeah, well, if we filled out the whole wheel, right? Because right. what we know and what we've talked about before is that when we're right. thinking about these areas, it includes being able to carry a pregnancy to term with dignity and integrity and without the risk of dying in the process. It means being able to have access to sex education for young people and older people too, who still need it. Mm -hmm. uh, it means access to being able to terminate a pregnancy. It means access to being able to have contraceptive health care. It yeah. means the government staying out of your business if, if, if you need the kind of gender affirming care and so much more, right? So when we're talking about these issues to just level set. Exactly, I mean, but th and that's where definitions are helpful, right? So reproductive rights are the legal protections that we uh, used to have, I guess. <laughs> I don't even know what language I'm gonna start using anymore, but rights are like reproductive rights. When we talk about that, those are the legal protections in which you know, we are able to operationalize or actualize you know, our reproductive life goals. When we talk about reproductive health or reproductive health services provision, we are talking about you go into an office or you go into a healthcare providing facility 
and someone will take your blood pressure and someone will do a physical exam and someone will, you know, put their hands on you in a way to help you optimize whatever the reproductive issue that you have is, whether it's infertility or uh, gynecologic cancer or whatever it is, right? That's reproductive health services provision. Rights are the legal protections in the ways that we think about them. Reproductive justice is a completely separate you know, a construct that I think is very important for folks to understand because it is a direct response to what we call reproductive oppression. And reproductive oppression is grounded in heterosexism, gender oppression, patriarchy, and racism. Okay. Reproductive justice was coined by 12 Black women in 1994 in response to the limited conversations that people were having around choice, right? We as black women understood that it is completely impossible to separate out social justice from reproductive health and from reproductive rights. So reproductive justice posits, I mean, and some people have put it forward as a theory, as a practice, as a praxis, as a strategy, as an advocacy tool, I think about it as all of them. I, I am not trying to be limiting because I think ownership is a tenant of white supremacy. So it can be as big as it needs to be, right? It has four basic, fund well, three basic fundamental tenets if you sit with reproductive justice organizers and people who coined the term in the South, they really believe that you have a right, a human right to decide when you want to become a parent and birth and to have all the supports that you need and the ways to be able to do that with dignity. Conversely, you have the human right to prevent and or end a pregnancy with all the supports that you need in terms and in able to be able to do that with dignity and free from coercion. And then the third tenet is that you have the right to parent the children you already have in safe environments, free from violence or coercion from any individual or from the state or the government. So that covers people like folks who are incarcerated. You don't have to, you know, terminate your parental rights. Or if you're, you know, disabled, you don't have to, like you get to parent the children that you have with all the supports and the dignity that you need. Right. I like the fourth piece, which is we need to disassociate sex from reproduction because that allows us to have really different conversation about healthy sexuality and pleasure and consent. This default heterosexism we have in our country is really weird. And when you ask people, how did they know what their sexual orientation was? If they're not a queer person, um, it's a default. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that we, we don't allow for more nuanced and more complicated conversations about why we need reproductive justice or why reproductive justice is, you know, deeply connected to voting rights. So, right. right. So then this brings me, you know, as I think about our conversation and just that importance of um, tracking through our history, clawing through our history so that we come to understand this, because when people think about, or certainly what we've seen in, in news recently, sure people struggle with this idea of understanding systemic inequality, mm -hmm. systemic discrimination, systemic racism, the sy systemic heterosexism and sexism within these spaces. And so what you're helping to do is to bring the terms in light with what has actually happened. So what I think of based on what you've said it makes me think about eugenics yes. as part of a legalized, sanctioned, systemic for So for people who are in denial, so you're like, well, there's never been these histories, right? Uh, and there's never been systemic inequality in this space. Then 1927, the United States Supreme Court and Buck v. Bell upholding a Virginia law providing for the compulsory sterilization of people who are poor and considered unfit. And yep. in this law, which has no definition about what unfit means, which basically leads to disparate kinds of policing of people and their bodies, and overwhelmingly, it's all poor people, Yep. right? Um, and the case involves a 16-year-old poor white girl who had been raped by her employer's nephew and became pregnant. 
And Virginia used her as a test case because yep. Virginia wanted to make sure that there would be a law upheld by the United States Supreme Court that would allow Virginia and every other state that wanted to do it to basically round up people and yep. prevent them from ever continuing their kind. And they got it in that case. In that case, the Chief Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes, said, said that three generations of imbeciles are enough. Yep. He said that the power that the state had to impose inoculation was broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Yep. His words. Yep. His words was that better than to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Yep. That's U.S. law yep. and that's U.S. jurisprudence yep. and U.S. jurisprudence that's never been overturned. Yep. It's still on the books. It's still on the book. Like for the people who were on this call, a lot of people don't know my dad is a constitutional lawyer. I've spent my entire life, you know, engaging with lawyers. And yeah, I was pretty stunned to realize that Buckley Bell is, is still on the books. Yeah, right? it's never been overturned. And right? that, and that, yeah, and that that the the pregnant capable people, the people at the center of that case never got a say. Never got a say. And and kids as young as 10 and 11 years old sterilized right and you know and the, the process that virginia would do when you know um before the supreme court took on the case and after you know they would ask the kids do you like jump rope do you like bubble gum do you like being sterilized to a 10 year old to right. an 11 year old right and like right. that history this is what you're talking about so that when we look at well you know where we are today is not a matter of imagination no. and it's not a matter of oh this just happened yesterday but we're actually talking about the sort of dismantling of systems that have grown over time. And I'm gonna come back to that because yeah. it relates to the Mississippi abortion case and the injunction put in that case by Judge Carlton Reeves and his yeah. reference to the Mississippi appendectomy. So we're gonna come back to that. Like, I hope yeah, to come yeah. back to that. Yeah. But I want to take us to uh, ethics. Um, ethics and what this means uh, in a time today when we see the dismantling of abortion rights in states yep. like Texas with HB, uh, SB 8, uh, in Mississippi with the 15-week abortion ban law, law. So how does ethics fit in to these spaces and in your profession? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell the story to answer this question. When I was training as a nurse, you know, in 1988, I'm younger than I look, um, we had just come forward with universal precautions because a novel infectious agent was killing gay people in cities across the United States. And it was the first time in my adult life, and I can't believe I'm saying the first time in my adult life, because I've seen this happen again, where 600,000 of our citizens just died, right? I started training during HIV and AIDS. And one of the things that happened was, you know, there was a, a I was a nursing student and our faculty uh, worked side by side with us during our training, just like our faculty have been doing now with other nursing students. And a lot of people said that that was unethical. And I never forget the day that I came into to work with my preceptor. There was an old uh, gentleman, older gentleman, who uh, he had swastikas on his arms, and he had been abusing the nursing staff. He had been there for weeks because they couldn't figure out what what was causing his GI bleed. And he pulled his NG tube out and he had been harassing the nurses. And so when it came time for a report to come up, my preceptor said, me and Ms. McLemore will take him. And this was, you know, pre-electronic uh, medication dispensing. We had a Cardex room, a room where you went into and you had to get the cards and write the medication down in the care plan for the day. And I, I followed my preceptor into the medication room and I said, why did you volunteer us to take care of him? And she looked me straight in the face and said, Ms. McLemore, you are my strongest student. She said, take a look around. She said, these nurses are worn down. They are tired. They are sad. They have been disrespected. If we take, take him today, you and me, and we give him really good care, then we've cared for our colleagues today too. I have never forgotten that. So when I think about conscientious objectors of abortion care, I can talk to them in the same way I can talk to conscientious providers of abortion care. Because for me, if we want to talk about ethics, part of the ethics when you're thinking about the health professions is whose needs matter first. 
Is it your personal discomfort and your need? I mean, when this first hit me, I realized like I had, when, when emergency department nurses wouldn't take care of our abortion patients who were going down downhill quickly or they, they were having, you know, uh, complications. I'm like, wait a minute, you just sent, patched up the person who was in the gang gun fight outside that's to go upstairs to OR for surgery so they can remove the bullet. But you wanna fight the 13 year old that's pregnant here in the ED because you don't wanna take care of her because you object? Like how, make, make that make sense to me. And one of the things our research found is it, it, when people say no in abortion, most of the time, it's not that they actually philosophically have a problem with abortion. Our data have shown, especially our qualitative data have shown, either people have a personal experience with abortion and they have not dealt with whatever feelings they have around it. They have never thought about abortion. And so this is the one time in real time when they have to make a rapid decision where they have to unpack how they actually feel about it, which is really unfair, right? or they are fundamentally diametrically opposed to abortion. And, and that is the smallest proportion of people that I've talked to in my research. And we've looked at this quantitatively and qualitative. The no is to make it somebody else's problem. So, not that they don't support abortion, not that they don't believe that people should have abortion. For some nurses that no is I've never taken care of an abortion patient. I don't even know what I would need to do, right? Yeah. So basically you're getting us to the point about training, which raises some very significant questions, right? And, and so let me just start that off with history again. You right. all thought you were just gonna get us like this. You didn't know that we would be taking you to history. Well, it makes me think about Dr. Marion Sims. Yeah. So Dr. Sims' statute has been yanked now from Central Park. Uh, Dr. Sims is notorious experimentations, cruelties, uh, terrorism, torture of black women's bodies was documented by himself yep. in his memoir, right? So these are not histories where we can say, well, someone made that up, up and somebody else wrote it, right? We can right. look right at the Supreme Court record. We can look right at what Dr. Sims wrote as right. he denied black women that he kept in a shack at the back of his house and would rouse in the middle of the night when he had an epiphany. He denied them um, uh, pain relief anesthesia. Uh, he either believed that Black women didn't need it, didn't deserve it, didn't feel pain, all of those things you see in various kinds of iterations. Right. But it makes me think, given how much medical schools have clung to him, labeling him the father of gynecology and whatnot, which is says a whole lot about framing, then why the framing hasn't been that we mandate that you know these procedures in medical school, nursing school, et cetera. We mandate that you know how to perform uh, a, a pregnancy termination. We mandate that you know how to engage in appropriate um, miscarriage, you know, relief. All of these things, why aren't we there? Because that will require us to center the people that we serve and not ourselves. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for the mic drop, but I'm now gonna, drop that so, mic. Let me give you a few more mics so that you can drop those too. <laughs> Every time I talk to students about this, I always say, why go back to your personal statements, go back to your professional statements. When you wrote to get into graduate school, what, what's the number one reason that people say they wanted to become a nurse, a dentist, a pharmacy, you know, a physician? It's they say they want to help people, right? That's yes. the number one reason. <laughs> I can answer that question. And so, but but I always push them. I say, okay, so what people? And and what do you mean by help? And can you really walk me through what it means to, to serve the public? I have often said that we have to be more discerning with who we admit into the health professions because the work that we do is in service to the public. It is a gift. When I think about the ways in which my life has been structured around the fact that I was able to become a nurse during one, the last deadly global pandemic that we had, right? That at any moment a needle stick could have killed me. But I was still willing to step up and willing to serve because I felt that strongly about making sure that people had dignified experiences regardless of how they got to us, that, that we're turning to homeostasis and to wellness, whatever level of acceptability that we could get them to would allow them to have a dignified life, right? Mm -hmm. I, I always say this to students and they are horrified when I say this, but I have never been pregnant. I am lucky I have never had to make a pregnancy decision in my life. I have no idea what kind of decision I would make. But people assume because of the kind of work that I do, centering the people that we serve, 
that somehow they can make all these assumptions about me. So, I mean, so these heuristics, these shortcuts are going to get us in trouble. They will continue to get us in trouble. So, so it also seems that what you're saying is you're making an argument that uh, the ethic of care is an ethic of care and not an ethic of denial of yes, care. Yes, it is. And that, that, that care provision, if, if we take oaths to say, whether it's, you know, Hippocratic and your physician, or whether if we're talking about EMTALA and not turning people away from emergency departments, if we, if we take all of these different oaths to say that these are the different things that as a profession, we are committing to serve the public and in exchange, the public will afford us prestige. Mm -hmm. They will afford us expertise they will afford us reverence and deverence, right? It, it, if that's the exchange, then you know we have to be willing to provide care. It is an ethic of care, regardless of how folks got to care, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This idea that we can pick and choose which patients we want to take care of is a problem. Well, you know, and this actually, since we are still in February, as short as this month is, um, and and that this is Black History Month, it reminds me of the documentary and the book, The Power to Hill, Power to because Hill. there is also this history of race that coincides and overlaps with this history of um, discrimination with regard to sex and LGBTQ folks, right. right, which is that, you know, it used to be racialized, right, Black people dying on the front steps of hospitals, Black right. people not being able to be admitted in. Uh, for the people who are on this call that may remember Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, when he was in a car accident where he lost um, actually one of his eyes, he wasn't able to go to the nearest hospital because even he, a world-renowned talent and musician uh, and actor, knew that he would not be served at certain hospitals even in the state of California because of segregationist kinds of policies. And these segregationist kinds of policies that were actually supported by premier medical organizations. I mean, it actually was a real fight by President Johnson to get Medicaid through because there were Medicaid essentially desegregated hospitals and exactly. segregated. I, I was gonna say the American Medical Association fought that. Right? That's one of the they did. Absolutely. Like, Historically. You know, some people argue that's one of the reasons why we don't have single payer. And I can't believe we have not used the word capitalism yet. I can't and believe that yes, either yes. in this conversation, right? I mean, right? No, or profit or whatever you want to use, right? I mean, one of the, the other thing is as long as our um, health training programs, so again, getting back to ethics, right? Because we also have to look at, well, how are our health training programs financed? Right. right? How do we pay for that? Generally, those are public dollars out of CMS and Medicaid and Medicaid, right? I mean, so when we think through, again, using that history, but bringing it to the present, whose bodies are being used as primary training sites for our clinical workforce in order to be able to learn the skills that they need to is poor people at public institutions or it's patients at Planned Parenthood, because that's the other thing. We allowed, and I, I, I've been saying this everywhere, right? When we segregated abortion care from all other aspects of physical care, and we, we left them to be neutralized, isolated, harassed, now all of a sudden we want to be confused because misinformation, the same tactics that were really honed on abortion care providers and abortion clinics are now being used and politicized as part of COVID-19. Like, why? We shouldn't be surprised. We yeah. were the canaries. Nicole wine. Right, right. Yeah, well, think about the ethics of that. Well, and I also think about the sort of ethics, uh, the ethics and morals, right, of what is the role of government then when we see these things in operation and practice. And here I'm thinking about the threats that, and this is actually taking the conversation in a way that I didn't anticipate, but I perhaps should have, right, because your work it's not as if the work that you do has not come with its own threats and challenges. Correct. We talked about this before and Correct. you opened the door to this just now. I, you know, uh, uh, being in a practice area where there have been the bombings of clinics, right? Since yeah. Roe v. Wade, there have been nearly 50 bombings in the United States of places that are providing mm -hmm. patient care. Mm -hmm. Every day in the United States, 
there are medical professionals, providers of care that are harassed and tormented as they are about to give care to mm -hmm. their clients and patients. Every day in the United States, there are people who are either supporting people who want to terminate a pregnancy or are going in to terminate a pregnancy themselves who are spat upon, who yeah. are pushed, who are shoved. I've talked with clinic directors who say that there are people who show up every day with guns right outside of their clinic. Yeah. There have been clinics that have been firebombed where arson has set a flame. And more staff and more nurses have been killed in that clinic based violence than physicians. I say this all the time. The other thing I say all the time too is, you know, when Mass General had to deal with the neo-Nazis outside of their hospital because their health equity, you know, black and Latinx physician folks were trying to provide care there, they shouldn't have been surprised because y'all let that happen to abortion care clinics. Right. I was talking to um, uh, our good colleague, Dr. Aletha Maybank, who is the chief equity officer at the American Medical Association. She was stunned and horrified when she rolled out their equity blueprint that somebody came and put graffiti on her house. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, wow, I, I hope you've read, you know, attorney David Cohen and Carol Jaffe's books on, you know, obstacle course and, and, and being in the crosshairs. These are tactics that people have tolerated in in mainstream healthcare, it, it's been okay to let the abortion people have, have that happen to them. But now all of a sudden, when you get neo-Nazis showing up at Brigham in Boston, folks are upset around health equity. Same know. tactics, same people. It's, it's just, just like the insurrection on January 6th. You talk about right. what's the role of government and the ethical provision of healthcare. Well, one place might actually be this idea that if you have citizens, a historical citizen running around who think that they can, you know, storm the Capitol and create an insurrection? People were really stunned that many abortion groups who maintain databases of people who harass clinics—they showed were, up on January sixth. Their we were, photos it, could be tied. These like photos that were there to identify, identify them outside of clinics. Identify. Exactly. They were able, because the Venn diagram between anti-abortion people and white supremacists is a circle. And, and, and it is because there is this, this deep, you know, lack of folks understanding how the dots connect. And that if black people brought to this country against their will, terrorized, captured as chattel slavery, built an entire country, drove an economy. This is why mentioning the word capitalism matters, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then we, we create different health care providers and different silos of service, either based on insurance status, ability to pay, or, you know, one's geographic location, that that's been acceptable and remains acceptable. Yeah. It's a problem, which again, goes back to the ethics of the distribution of abortion care providers, because we haven't talked about that either. No, we haven't. And when we think about that distribution and what it means uh, nationwide, we think about a state like Mississippi having only one abortion okay. clinic remaining and that there are other states where now that is the same. Uh, when you think about uh, people having to drive hours and it's not just driving the hours in order to get to the near, nearest clinic, but because there are targeted regulations of abortion providers and all these kind of trap laws, you may drive, but you're going to have to actually drive back right. a few days later exactly. and have to get babysitting care, take time off from work, all of this because of lies and misinformation you have to listen to in the waiting room, right? The unnecessary ultrasounds that you may, may or may not need, like all of that, right? But again, we've allowed that to happen because unlike our good public health colleague, Dr. Kamara Jones, who happens to be the presidential chair at UCSF this year, she always talks about we have to distribute resources based on need. Mm -hmm. That's a real public health approach. That's a real care, ethics of care approach. We would distribute our resources based on need. So you you mentioned capitalism, and so let's talk about it because it also gets us back to some foundations where people really sort of struggle to understand. And so let's you know open that door up yeah. more because we're also talking about histories where the capital um, in U the United States, and here I'm talking about the financial capital generated in the United States, was was born quite literally in the wombs of black women, right? Mm -hmm. um, where Wall Street that the second largest auction block in the United States 
Wall Street, uh, where people, you know, if you think about the mortgage on your house, did you know that kind of mortgaging started with black bodies, right? Where people yeah. wanted to be able to, more, and then the insurance that you'd get sort of like life insurance based on because what use is a yeah. dead enslaved person? Yeah. So life insurance meant you like work them hard, work them hard. <laughs> and then here's some life insurance that kicks back, you right. know, all of these kinds of systems and then laws created around that laws such as uh, a child in the United States, the earliest laws in the United States that a child will inherit the status of her mother, mother. Rather than her yep. father. complete change yeah. of the laws that otherwise would have been adopted from England, but purposefully right for the status of reinstantiating next generations into enslavement even if their fathers happen to be white mm -hmm. and this is part of that capitalist history that you're talking about in terms of the commodification and i just want to add one point and then let you respond to it yeah which is that when we think about that famous speech of sojourner truth mm -hmm. ain't i a woman and most people thinking of it as a matter of chivalry she starts off that speech with saying and i bore 13 children yeah. and saw nearly each one snatched from my arms and nobody heard my cry but god ain't i a woman and that's a story of that's a, a story of capitalism and it's also a story of ethics and morality and law yeah yeah i mean and, and it gets to, I mean, you know, the word personhood just went through my mind in, in a couple of different ways, but it, it really does get to this whole idea that, you know, when we enter the health professions and we want to be able to take a life course perspective in assisting the people we serve reach their reproductive life goals, abortion is an essential component of that. Right. I mean, the, you know, why is that? Because some people might say, well, you know, I don't know that abortion has to be a part of that. Why should abortion be a part of that? Well, because, you know, the truth of the matter is the people who have births and the people who have abortions are not different people. They are the same people. They're just at different time points in their lives. Right. Our collaborator, you know, at answer, Dr. Diana Green Foster shown beautifully in the turnaway study that, you know, up to upwards of 88% of people who have abortions are already parents. We knew that, right? And so this idea that that someone else can can you know make a determination for you that will impact the future of your life without consulting you mm -hmm. is really ethically problematic. And when we codify that in the workforce training to be able to say that the only people whose opinions matter in clinical environments are conscientious objectors and not conscientious providers of abortion care, mm -hmm. we are having an incomplete conversation. Right, right. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I wanna take a moment for our audience in case you have questions, please begin to populate them in the Q&A, and I will try to get to those questions, but this is a time for you to begin doing that, placing your questions in the Q&A. So I'm wondering then, where do we go to from here? Because we're at a time in which the United States Supreme Court may very well uh, dismantle Roe, not that Roe was ever the North Star, which you've right. talked about, and I've heard you talked about, which I've talked about too, but this is about you, right? Like, you know, so yeah. Roe was, uh, so, right, <laughs> exactly. Um, and given that that's where we are with, you know, the Dobbs case before the United States Supreme Court will probably hear its ruling in the case in May or June. Right. So what happens next? How do we correct this this tide given where we're going what's the role of medical providers in doing this of nurses of doctors in this space well i mean so you know schumer and the senate have reintroduced the women's health protective protection act and i'm glad they're going to force the vote i don't think it'll pass but you know it's nice to have people on the record saying what they will and won't support um, Roe was never the best that we could get. And one of the reasons why I started off with some of the current landscapes and some of the wins, when you think about the codification of abortion, you know, within, you know, law in New Jersey and, you know, uh, uh, advanced practice clinicians becoming of abortion providers in Hawaii and in Virginia, 
When you think about the fact that the South Carolina Fetal Heartbeat Protection from Abortion Act was defeated, or when you think about the race and sex selection bans that were defeated in Arizona with, with a partnership between NOPOF and NAACP, in coalition, when we stand with the public and we educate them about these issues, they're with us, right? So maybe this is a prime opportunity. And I'd like to remind the listeners in, you know, Dobbs, we got our first ever human rights grounded black maternal health brief led by Dr. Joya Career Perry and the National Birth Equity Collaborative making the argument that human rights trumps any state's rights in the context of a pregnancy, right? So for me, I, I sort of see this as an opportunity for us to try and build better than what Roe actually gave us while also trying to ensure that the people who need abortion care now can receive it with dignity, you know, with all the supports that they need. That said, there are some asks that we need to make of people that historically we have not made asks of. And one, you know, notion that I have always rejected um, that I know is really rampant in our field is this idea that people have just shrugged their shoulders and said, well, well, there'll never be any hospital-based abortion. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just accepted that as a, you know, penalty and that will never happen. And I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I don't, and I keep asking organizations that are very, very overtly focused, you brought this up earlier, on maternal morbidity and mortality and our rising statistics, right? I've asked the Centering Healthcare and Centering Pregnancy folks, I've asked the March of Dimes and the NIH folks, if I have a call with the Gender Policy Council next week, for all the people who want to mitigate maternal morbidity and mortality, and particularly the Black maternal health crisis, you know, specifically, how do you think you're going to do that in the context of having Roe being dismantled and having further reduced? Well, that, that's right, because it seems to me that one of the things that's been missed, right, with the reporting that's been done about the increase rather than the decrease of maternal mortality and its effects in Black women's lives and other women too, because we saw those rates increase also for Latinx women as well, is that it's being framed as, well, this was about COVID rather than no, this was about attacks on abortion too, right. where you have right. clinics closing, where are people getting their contraception? Right. Where are people being able to get prenatal care? Right. We've just seen across the country, the closing of places that were providing the most essential care for people who are becoming pregnant, all gone. And we've not seen in the place of that in places like Louisiana and Texas and other places where this is happening. You've not seen county hospitals opening. You've not seen the governor saying, well, okay, let's make sure that we put a clinic um, there that's going to provide care for low-income people just like that clinic that was closed because of our trap laws, which is right. now gone. That didn't happen. And the other ethical piece to that is, they're using the fake clinics, the, price, the crisis pregnancy centers or the pregnancy help centers, some of which have clinical services, some do not, some have, are wrought with misinformation, some are religiously affiliated. Some people are in some states like Ohio and Texas, they are trying to use those as a potential you know, replacement to address the social determinants of health without <laughs> acknowledging the harm that those okay. cause. So, right. all right. So, so another question that came up just as you were mentioning that, because part of this dismantling, so, so let's just put some more facts out there so people can be armed, right? So, yeah. so we know that a person in the United States is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than not. Yep. So that's important for level setting because so much of the rhetoric is, isn't it the most dangerous thing in the world to terminate a pregnancy, right? Rather yeah. than it being the opposite. Rather than pregnancy being a dangerous condition. It's, it's, exactly, it's, as it is, right? So the okay. World Health Organization compares the safety of an abortion to a penicillin shot, right? So just to kind of level set, we know that in Texas, where we've seen the most prolific of anti-abortion a legislating taking place, it's much more dangerous to get a colonoscopy than it is to terminate a pregnancy. And we also know that when we're looking at maternal mortality, Black women as a national matter are three and a half times more likely to die. But once we actually, than their white counterparts, but once we start digging into these counties, there are yeah. places in which Black women are 10 times more likely to die right. than their counterparts, 15 times more likely to We're die. Well, like it was in New York City. Exactly. Right. So so given that it, it's it's startling to me that 
that kind of framing hasn't been more front and center. Yeah. And so I'm wondering why that is, because, I mean, we're talking about matters of life and death, if we really think about it in that way. And it gets to your question of personhood, whose personhood matters? Right. And, you know, it is, it is a, it, it's something that I think that clinical health services provision and public health are going to have to wrestle with. So we would be remiss not to make a distinction between those two things, because I also think yes. that's really important, yes. because clearly we're having a problem with that in COVID, right? right? I mean, public health and other kinds of mitigation strategies should be synergistic with health services provision. But again, in, in, with the over-medicalization of everything, we, we've tried to put everything into the clinical care provision bucket with, without forgetting that we also need its, its sidekick. Mm -hmm. Health services provision, you know, has a sidekick, it's called public health mitigation strategies, right? We were able to reduce large numbers of auto fatalities by introducing the public health measure called yep. seat belts. Yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, so I, I'm needing folks to break it down just like that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, a public health mitigation strategy. You make exactly. sometimes you need an umbrella when it's raining outside. You don't see right. one when it's sunny. Sometimes you need a mask when COVID is surging in your neighborhood. Sometimes <laughs> you can take them off, right? But it's this this notion that we want everything to be these weird binaries when it's much more complicated than that. So as we're thinking about what comes next, do you think that there are certain opportunities that have actually come through these dark times? And what do the opportunities look like if you think so? And I want to maybe start with, um, you know, abortion pills, individuals being able to be at home, avoid being spat at, and just avoid the threats and people taking their photos we by being new, able to be at home. We have new tools and technology now than we had prior to the decriminalization of abortion under row. And, you know, having access to mifepristone and misoprostol is game changing, right? So knowing that those technologies exist it is, is, is one, you know, bright spot. Maybe we can have a more nuanced discussion of, of making them even more accessible if having an inclinate or an aspiration abortion is going to continue to be, you know, further, uh, um, distinguished or eliminated in different geographies. Here's another thing that's, that's controversial, right? I don't understand why midwives are allowed to catch live babies, but they're not allowed to attend at induction terminations for people who need them. That's a whole other discussion too. We're going to do a workshop on that at the American College of Nurse Midwives. Cause I'm like, wait a minute, you normally are responsible for shepherding two people through a process safely, but now you only got to get one through and somehow you want to tell me on how to do that. Like, so there's that right. But right. there will always be people who need aspiration abortions, right? Mm -hmm. Medication abortion is not a panacea. So how do we create those services for those individuals who either need those or who will choose those? And to, to make that everybody's responsibility. Like now we can have a conversation about MUA and MVA, right? Having, you know, manual vas vacuum aspirators for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Well, I, you know, I think that that's really important what you you know suggested, which is that as we go forward, there is a way to think about actually what the North Stars should be within this particular constellation, uh, rather than just thinking about it within a very narrow framework and right. thinking beyond the framework that it's only MDs who should be centered in these conversations, but rather as you started with, that right. the centering itself should be the patients, the people who are in need of the medical services and then building from there. And that that really um, is the ethical challenge for us, that that's the lane in which we need to be. So I'm gonna offer for a Q and A for one last time before we wrap up any additional questions that you all might have, then please place them in our Q and A before I wrap up with Dr. Mecklemore. But I also want to ask you, you know, we're at a time in which we can't separate what's happening in medicine and the attacks on reproductive health rights and what this means for reproductive justice 
from other things that are taking place at the same time, because this is not a silo, right? It's not I as if everything else is great and it only happens to be this is where questions are arising. So I'm wondering how you see this within the context of our democracy. Yeah. People are just beginning to sort of ask questions about, is this related to the rule of law? Is this related to democracy? And what's your response to that? Well, voting rights, I mean, historically have allowed us to be able to ensure that as citizens, you know, we are protected under the law. I, so I don't I don't know how else to explain this to people, right? And so voting rights are reproductive justice rights because it, the different legislatures that have been introducing these bills clearly are not representing the interests of the people that they're supposed to be representing. I mean, we've had a Texas legislation evaluation project for what, almost a decade? And those data show that the, the pregnant capable people in Texas want different things than what legislatures are affording them, right? right? Or same in Mississippi, right? When I think about the Pink House Defenders and when I think about the Yellow Hammer Fund, they are the first people to say that they are being held hostage by the people who govern their legislature. So therefore voting rights becomes a reproductive justice right. When we think about surveillance and, and, and you know policing and unarmed shooting of black men, who did George Floyd call for? He called for his mother. Yep. Right? Yep. These are reproductive justice rights. Yep. Yeah. So when I think about how do we string together a new coalition that will be grounded in human rights, that will free us from our fear of gender oppression and patriarchy and heterosexism and racism and actually allow us to build, we had an opportunity, I still think we do at the height of the pandemic. Remember all that mutual aid? Yeah. Remember how everybody was trying to really balance fear with disorientation because oh my goodness we're in a global pandemic yeah right there, there was an opportunity we can make we can, here here's the secret that nobody wants you to know we can make opportunities like that again mm -hmm. and we don't need crisis to create opportunity no right <laughs> exactly no, we, we need to be yeah. move beyond that right and it's yeah. sad right because when we think about this but uh, we can take a harm yeah. reduction approach right how do we reduce harm exactly. and the easiest way when i think about this ethically is we need to diversify the workforce of abortion providers of people who can get trained to be able to make sure that people can get miffy and meso mm -hmm. who can get trained to understand how to manage you know abnormal and unintended pregnancy who can get trained to know how to do manual vacuum aspiration that's a harm reduction approach and it's an urgently needed approach Dr. Monica McLemore, I am again so honored that you joined me today and that you helped to launch our three-part series on contemporary issues in health, law, and bioethics with our session today on ethical and workforce considerations in abortion care provisions. For our audience, I want to thank you as you have placed it so much respect and love for this conversation in our Q&A over and over again, right. saying that this is the smartest conversation that you've heard about reproductive justice, social justice, and history. Uh, thanking us and thanking you, uh, Dr. McLemore, for lifting up such important considerations in your talk today, including what's been happening in Boston, appreciating the connections and truth telling. Um, thank you all so much for placing that in our Q&A and for uh, your support of this program today. We really appreciate it. Before we close out, any last comments, Dr. McMore? Well, first of all, thank you. And thank you to the audience. I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to share some of these thoughts. And we really need to continue to expand the voices that we are listening to. All right. Well, with that, uh, Thank you all so very much for joining us. This has been Dr. Monica McLemore, who is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, and whose work 
is everywhere. Um, I hope that you follow her on Twitter where you'll be able to see uh, some of her work when she posts it there. Uh, look for her on her website where you'll be able to follow uh, her work. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an honor and pleasure. It's always good to be with you. And thank you to our audience. That's thank it for you. now. Join us for our next program. Thank <laughs> you.